So um, I think we're going to go ahead and get started while the panel members are uh, finding their seats. Um, I'm going to say a couple of words about Nicole. Uh, she was introduced previously, but maybe not all of you heard the bi the bio sketch. Uh, she's an American engineer and a NASA astronaut. She served as a flight engineer on ISS Expedition 20 and 21, and a mis mission specialist on STS 128, 129, and 133. She's over 100 days in space, uh, during which she completed two spacewalks. She's also an instrument-rated private pilot. One thing I did note, Nicole, I didn't know this about you, you're a pioneer in the use of social media from space. So I noted on October 21, Stott and her Expedition 21 crewmate, Jeff Williams, participated in the first NASA tweet up from the station with members of the public gathered at NASA headquarters. So there you go, you're a social media pioneer. So without further ado, I'll hand the panel over to you. Okay. Thanks, Graham. I'm gonna sit this time. <laughs> And our, our panel session now is uh, analogs. We've, um, we've had this session um, at least two years now. And um, so I think we'll be continuing with that. Um, I'm, I'm going to take the opportunity. Who do we have? So um, Vadim is here. Dave? OK. That's OK. Um, and, and introduce um, our new panel members. We've met doctors. Um, uh, Gushin and Barrett in previous panel sessions, but um, I'd like to take the opportunity to um, read Dr. Dingus's. No, 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 no. <laughs> Just, they know who I am. They know who you are. We're not going to read it then. <laughs> Everybody. It's helpful to me. I mean, the, I'm gonna, I am going to say this at the end, though. Um, he and his colleagues have conducted significant or conducted scientific studies in a range of analogs since we're, this is what we're talking about, including on ISS, in Mars 500, in the Antarctic, in the JSC HERO facility on Devon Island, and in NEMO, my favorite at the end there. Um, and just to throw that out there, um, our newest panel member, um, Dr. An Andrew Abercrombie here, and I am going to read his. I don't know if they know me. They, uh, they should, though, see? Um, master's in mechanical engineering um, were, and was working on X-38 in the flight mechanics uh, laboratory, has a PhD in motor control working in the JSC Neurosciences Laboratory, previously was a deputy lead in project engineer for the multi-mission space exploration vehicle project, and is now the lead of NASA's EVA physiology laboratory where they're doing development of pre-breath protocols, human-focused testing of spacesuits, EVA concept of operations testing. Um, he has experience as a PI, field engineer, submersible pilot, and scientific research diver in over 20 science expeditions and analog field tests, including the Pavilion Lake Research Project in British Columbia, Desert Rats in Arizona, the Houghton Mars in the High Arctic, uh, Nemo in the Aquarius Underwater Habitat, and with the Russian Antarctic Expedition diving beneath frozen lakes in the mountains of Antarctica. So, Andrew. <laughs> All right, so we, we are the last panel of the day. Uh, we are going to make it quick here because I think we have 40 minutes. Um, we have a really nice blend of expertise here on this panel with um, the, the analog subject. Um, our topics for this panel are the application of remote expeditions to human performance, kind of at a high level, and the necessity for high fidelity and realistic analogs to simulate spaceflight. Um, I, I would say over the past two days, in almost all of our panel sessions, there has been some mention of analogs, e even if the word analogs wasn't used. Um, I would argue that the best analogs are the ones that are meaningful missions on their own and that also take place in an environment that best simulates the environment you're training or preparing for, even though, like to fly in space, we can't go to fl space to fl learn to fly in space. Um, throughout our astronaut training, uh, most of our um, training in some way or another is associated with working as a team, working as a crew. We've also heard that throughout um, many of the sessions 
these past two days. A lot of that training is analog based in one way or another. And for me personally, uh, in preparation for flying to the space station, for living and working in space for um, several months, I would have to say that uh, what I experienced in my training, the NEMO mission that we did where we lived and worked um, and worked on a real mission with real science and exploration development activities uh, underwater for 18 days in the Aquarius habitat was the closest analog to what it was like to live and work in space. And I don't discount any of the other ones. I believe that there are other opportunities out there across the board that this panel will represent that can um, show us what that value is. And so I'd like to just go down the line and I'd like to ask you each to give uh, a brief introduction um, beyond what I've already said about you of your experience with analogs and why you feel like um, or what high fidelity aspects of, of analog missions are the most important. Okay, um, so thanks Nicole. And um, I guess b before we get to that, I just wanna follow on from the previous uh, panel on education by saying that the reason I'm here today mm -hmm. um, is that uh, back in 1997, I participated in an education outreach project um, led in large part by Mr. Abbey, supported by a lot of others, including Nicole and Professor Dunbar. Um, that inspired me. That um, That's why I now live here, work for NASA, and, and have uh, dedicated my career to, to human spaceflight. So it works. I, I thank you. And uh, what you do makes a difference, I promise you. Um, so yeah, uh, analogs. Um, my, my uh, Nicole already kind of read off the, the, the high level overview. My experience began with Desert Rats where we were testing, we were doing multi-day simulations of prototype pressurized rovers um, in the desert about 45 minutes north of Flagstaff. And uh, that testing, it, we accomplished everything we set out to and, and it met our definition of an extreme environment because it was more than 20 miles from a Home Depot, which as engineers, <laughs> that, was, that, was a, that was a stretch for our prototype uh, hardware we were testing. So, um, but <clears throat> with respect to the, the discussion topics um, that, that we're trying to hit on today, uh, I think that the, uh, of my experiences, the most relevant w was uh, my Antarctic expedition. Um, I could probably talk at length on, on all the, the different aspects that I felt were relevant to um, as a spaceflight analog. We were, in brief, we were exploring, doing kind of astrobiology exploration of a couple of frozen lakes. Um, on the uh, opposite side of Antarctica from McMurdo, we went through a Russian base. Um, we were, you know, we were a small international team. There were five of us from four different countries. We're, we're dealing with um, very low bandwidth communication, asynchronous communication. We were um, supported remotely by a, a team of scientists back in uh, uh, North America and Russia primarily. Uh, there was a lot of fatigue, a lot of stress, periods of very high workload, periods of very low workload, um, which bring, brings its own challenges. We spent an inordinate amount of time on logistics and repair and maintenance of stuff. Each day I would write in my journal, how many minutes or hours of science did we actually get done today? And a lot of days it was zero because we were just spending so much time on, on repair, maintenance and logistics. Um, but the uh, you know, we were also doing science when, when we could, of course, that was the purpose we were there. A lot of science tasks, we were um, operating ROVs, we were doing diving, we were hiking around the mountainsides. Um, but the, the, the real takeaway when I kind of look across it all, it distills down to, I think, what Nicole already said from her own experiences, that we were doing real meaningful work at all times. There was nothing contrived. Uh, there was real risk. It was a real inhospitable environment, but all the risks that we were taking were for, for a reason. Um, now that is you know, probably not a new revelation to anybody. I think that's you know, probably quite well understood. But the light bulb that went on for me uh, while I was in Antarctica was actually something that, that Dr. Barrett hit on yesterday, where uh, you were talking about the, the new generation of, of astronauts being motivated by discovery. And what, what I realized for myself was that you know, I was fortunate enough while out there, we you know, made several um, discoveries, if you like, ranging from fairly small, but um, even, even the smallest discovery, we, we found both personally, I, it, it had a very sort of restoring and rejuvenating effect on us. You know, we'd been there long enough, we'd put in a lot of work, a lot of long, cold days. Um, but it seemed to sort of restore the motivation and, and, uh, and I noticed it not just in myself, but, but in the rest of the team. And 
I, I also noticed that when we began the return journey, uh, it took us uh, more than a week to get out to the lake and, and uh, about the same amount of time to get back. And I found my, my state of mental well-being, which I think was pretty good overall, but I was trying to kind of gauge my own um, feelings and reactions through, throughout the whole expedition. My, my mental state was different on the return journey from, than from the outbound journey. Um, and, and, you know, and I think that's to be expected, right? And, and my mental state was different at the destination than for either transits. So looking at, for example, winter over as, a, as an analog for a Mars mission, that's, that's just one part of it, right? The, what we were doing at our destination couldn't be more different from kind of hunkering down inside of a, inside of a habitat. And hopefully when we're on Mars, we're going to be doing a lot of this exploration and, and hopefully discovery. And I think that discovery effect has a huge impact on the mental state of the explorers, I hope. Um, and so, um, yeah, the, I, I guess the, the, the food for thought that I, I would offer up is that... Um, and it, it's something I've talked about with a, a few people since since getting back from Antarctica. You know, consider say an analog where you begin with a winter rover, you then do some real scientific uh, expedition exploration, and then end with a winter rover. And I think my hypothesis would be that what you find in the in the phase one is different from the phase two, and both of those are different from phase three, um, and all of those I think would be different from what you would find during just a, a, a straight up winter rover. So uh, there's some, some food for thought to get started. The, the winter over could almost mean the, the, the transit to Mars. <laughs> the intermediate is the exactly. time on Mars and the it, it, winter exactly. over is your way back. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, I, and I, yeah, again, my, my observation was that the, the transit phase was different. On the way out there, there's still anticipation, a lot of you know, the excitement. You're experiencing new things. Um, you know, the, you've not been traveling for that long at that point. You've not been away from home that long. On the way back, there's not that much new. Um, you know, and a lot of the time, you're just kind of ready to be done, but you still have this long journey, and you need to stay focused. And, and so, so my, just speaking for my, myself, my mental state was very different. And so I think you would find that in your first winter over, the data is different from your second winter over. <laughs> cool. Thank you, Andrew. Misha. Yeah, it's hard to yes. top that. Once I'm not alphabetically privileged to go first, so uh, now I have to follow something. <laughs> and really I have cool. to throw out that Mike and I had the opportunity to fly in space on both of our space yeah. flights, which um, was really very special. And I have this distinct memory of us crossing over from the, on STS-133, the second flight, crossing over from Discovery onto the station together, and just kind of looking at each other like, "Wow, you know, did we ever leave this place?" Yeah. It's very familiar. So comfortable, so just normal, just like we were meant to be there, that second home kind of thing. So We need to go back. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so thanks. I, I really I, I loved hearing uh, Andrew's stories here. Um, so real quick, my, my analog experiences. We, we have some analog experiences we do as almost a canned training track in, in the office. And so I've done cold weather training with Nicole, actually. Um, I've also, uh, I'm a Nemo veteran as well, and a Caves veteran. Caves is a, uh, a venue we have in Sardinia that the European Space Agency runs. <clears throat> it includes a week of training you know, with an international crew and then six days underground in a cave. Uh, Dr. Furukawa is here somewhere, right? He was one of my cave mates in 2013. <clears throat> we have uh, backpacking, sea kayaking, and some other things. Uh, and although I haven't been a resident of Hera, I'm responsible for putting Hera, the old deep space hab from Desert Rats, into Building 220 for Dr. Pulaski to then actually turn into a real science program, which has done quite well. And uh, has uh, recently one done three campaigns of 30-day isolation or so? Four. Four. Okay. Awesome. Four this year. Next year. Up to 45 days next year. Great. So, so I, I believe strongly in analogs. But before I talk about the elements of a good spaceflight analog, I'll, I'll just kind of talk a little bit about what I think the purpose is. And, and, and so the, the, there's many purposes. So the answer of what elements make a good one or, or kind of depends on which of these purposes you're going for. So one of those is, is study of the flight-related human factors uh, that include behavioral health and performance, uh, inducing things like communication delays, other handicaps, which might be commensurate with flying in space. You can use habitats for evaluation of new candidates, which, which is certainly done, uh, selection of new candidates, 
uh, for training. And for training, then you're looking for a different set of metrics, if you will, uh, to judge fidelity. And probably something we, we still somewhat underuse in, in uh, our astronaut training program. Uh, I think uh, it's, uh, development of ops products is a very strong motivator for having a good habitat or a good uh, analog. Procedures, planning, inventory tools, some of those things that we always piggyback into the HERA campaigns and uh, even the NEMO campaigns. And it's a tremendous venue to shake down a project before you fly it on station. And uh, we certainly see that help. And then, of course, the development of isolation countermeasures, whether you're isolated in Building 220 uh, or uh, in the Concordia Station in Antarctica, a lot of those uh, products are the same. So then the elements of a good spaceflight analog, again, it depends on whether you're looking at training or study or development of some of these products. Some of the common ones, though, isolation, uh, you, you really do... You want to be isolated to the point where it's not easy or convenient to reemerge into the real world. That's a little bit harder in Building 220 than it is in the Arctic, um, but uh, I think that's that's a strong one. Uh, discomfort. So we're not actually trying to put people into discomfort zones so much as to expand their comfort zones. Um, so it's got to be something that is outside of their normal set of circumstances that they grew up with, that they worked in, and uh, that, again, you can't anticipate all the discomfort is going to happen with space flight, so we might as well start expanding that envelope on the ground. And discovery, and I, I really loved what Andrew said, in that um, you, you want to add new discovery into your analogs, just like you're anticipating into space flight. That increases the fidelity probably more than any um, mock-up or, or any uh, procedures that, that are flight-like than you could possibly imagine. You blend all those together, the, the discomfort zone, if you will, melding the physical and the psychological capital and doing science at the same time. That's a good analog. Uh, when Dr. Furukawa and I were in the uh, caves uh, analog in Sardinia, one of the most exciting things was discovering a new life form. Well, not too many people have been there before, uh, so it wasn't too hard to do. But, but we actually found a life form that had never been seen before, never been characterized before, and was keyed out by some of our colleagues at the University of Bologna. That's pretty cool. It was not comfortable to be there. We didn't have to work quite like you did a week to get to the venue. It took us about four hours from the surface to base camp. Uh, but it was bloody dangerous down there, and we worked extremely hard. And uh, so when you had something like that on top of it, it gave you a, a metric of, of worthwhileness, if you will, of, uh, of worth of the, uh, the venue. Um, I think critical reliance on gear and procedures and practices, exactly how we have it in spaceflight. And Mistakes have real consequences. That's part of why we fly T-38s, high-performance aircraft. That's part of why we use the caves venue. And uh, you can definitely make a case for not doing this when you're looking at an overall safety uh, profile. And we spent a lot of time, actually, at NASA um, first of all, analyzing the safety, the benefits versus the risk there, and second of all, defending them. Uh, but just like you wouldn't want to send a fighter pilot into theater on, on war day if they haven't had a lot of high performance time actually simulating dogfights. We don't want to send people into space with, without the mindset that knowledge of their technical systems, the procedures, the practice, the timeliness, the communication, um, if you screw that up, there are real consequences. And so I think CAVES was a, a terrific analog uh, for that. But I believe strongly that a good analog has real consequences for mistakes. Um, I would also posit that there, there is, and, and I'll, I'll first say I, I agree with Nicole that the, the NEMO, the Aquarius analog, is by far the closest flight-like analog we have as far as proximity of number of crew members, size of module, uh, ops products that we use, time to surface versus time to, to the ground if you're in space because you're in saturation. Uh, but there is a difference <clears throat> between the analog studies and the actual crew experience. When you look at Concordia, which I think is an amazing installation, European Space Agency runs it, you, you spend a year in Concordia, you are truly isolated, 13 or 14 people, but they meet each other one or two weeks before they deploy. And the same is true with a lot of folks who deploy to Antarctica. When we lock people in the Hera for 30 days, they know each other for, what, two weeks or so. Uh, and they come from very different walks of life. Whereas when we fly, we already have a common mindset, a common language, a common set of terminologies, a common set of expectations. And it is a very different, highly coordinated crew which I like to think of us as well-mannered professionals. Uh, doesn't mean that things don't arise, make no mistake. Uh, but very different from some of these analog populations that we study. 
Uh, and the average age is, is quite a bit different, whereas uh, the, the, some of these analogs, the average age is maybe 15 to 20 years lower than, than we are. Uh, so you really have to keep that in mind if you're trying to insert, interpret those results. Um, last two points. By now, we actually do have a pretty significant population of souls who've flown long duration spaceflight and graduated from a lot of these analog venues. So again, the, the, almost the normal track right now is to do a NEMO mission underwater saturation diving, caves, some of these other venues. We do sea kayaking, backpacking, whatnot. And I don't know if we've made the effort to pull this population and ask what analogs match up best to what attributes of actual spaceflight. So from a training standpoint and shaking down some of these other products, I think that might be uh, worth doing. Uh, last point, the line for spaceflight is, is fairly long. There's not very many slots. Um, there's always a few more people than slots. And to really keep an astronaut, cosmonaut, uh, taikonaut's head in the game, you, I believe you must do analog experiences like this every one to three years at the minimum uh, to keep those expeditionary behaviors strong and to build new team interactions. And you're always going to learn things. I, I flew in space before I did caves, and I learned a lot about team interaction and expeditionary behaviors doing caves. So I believe it, it should be part of our, our proficiency and maintenance training for uh, space fires. So. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. So um, uh, my focus as a uh, scientist for uh, U.S. federal agencies is uh, a little it, it, it a little bit different from what you heard. My concern is not how well you do when I put you in something where you know each other and everything's fine and things are going along. I want to know what you do when the lights go out, the temperature goes below zero, you have no additional clothing, and uh, two of your comrades are missing. In other words, I don't want to see you when you look good. I want to see you when you're really up against it. And now how do I keep you going? How do I detect that, know, the, know your risk of it, know what you're going to do, and keep you going? So it's a completely different way of looking at humans in these environments. So for me, the environments are never really stressful enough. I'd ramp it up further, and they don't last long enough. And moreover, if you want to understand what astronauts are going to do in these environments, use astronauts. Don't, if I was training uh, 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 pilots and I wanted to know how they're going to handle certain situations, I wouldn't put truck drivers up there in, in the cockpit and say, "Fly the air, pretend you're flying the airplane now. And, and so I think we, what we have to do is start thinking about what are the fidelity factors. And Mike named them off, and I, I agree completely. Um, the more, and I know we cannot always get astronauts and cosmonauts. They're supposed to be in space doing things with the space agencies. But uh, whenever possible, if we can study them in space or get them in um, uh, uh, space activities um, with the, the full context of spaceflight, we should try and do it. And, and hence, I was grateful when NASA allowed us to just upload some of our software. Many people say, how'd you get into space so fast? And I said, well, I didn't ask to move any hardware up. I just put software up through their system and put it on their SSCs. And, uh, uh, and it, it was simple. And it only took three minutes. The astronauts hated me. And I was, oh. I've been called, to, oh no, they did. I actually don't mind being hated. I, since I induced all sorts of stress <laughs> in people, I, I actually kind of take it as an insult if you like me after what I've done to you. <laughs> So no, I'm quite serious about that. Okay, as a scientist, I step. I watch. I study humans as animals. Okay, I don't want to be your friend. I'm not going to be. I don't. I don't need a photograph with you. I want to know what you're going to do when something happens, and I want to know exactly what countermeasure you need. I want to know how vulnerable you are, and that's another thing I'll return to in a minute. But the um, reason we're studying astronauts, cosmonauts, is they very likely. Um, uh, have some special phenotypes that allow them to do this. And it's been worked out through all the years they train and fly, how they handle G-forces and everything else. So uh, there probably is some, some of that that's worth trying to, to study when we can. Um, when we can't get that, astronaut surrogates are good. That depends on the quality of the surrogates. I don't consider anybody in their 20s an astronaut surrogate. Okay, the brain is not ready for prime time below 32. So frankly, you know, <laughs> 20, I'll allow 28. But uh, we've studied, we, and now remember, so I don't, I didn't spend my time doing operational field studies where you can't control everything. I've run a couple thousand people 
in extreme conditions in the laboratory. You don't get to call home. Nobody's going to rescue. You have to say, I want out, and I'll let you out. Okay. Otherwise, you might go four days with no sleep, with bloodlines in, doing constant work, uh, with, with people interacting with you who you don't know. Okay, with having to give your urine to us, or take blood three times, or, and, it, and it never ends. It's 24 hours a day, and, and nobody comes and loves you. <laughs> so we get a lot of data on this. We know the dynamics of what, what will deter you. Now, we recover them. We're covered by IRB. Everybody gets recovered. <laughs> we bring them back. Everybody yeah. goes back. Although the issue of recovery is a serious one, and it is actually for space flight. You know, we don't know much about the dynamics of recovery. But so, I, I'm, and I'm serious, I do actually think there's an important place for finding all the right positive things. But we have to know a worst case scenario, too. We have to know what's going to happen when the crew loses a crew member. Early in a mission, with, with no ability to turn around and go back, and it's a critical crew member who knows, has a skill set that the others don't entirely have. And communication delays are in the system. Uh, stay tuned for the Mars movie from that geo. Um, the, <laughs> um, for me, I, I like the, I, we've had privile been privileged to try a bunch of these analogs, and, and so the, the fidelity factors I like are astronauts cosmonauts or astronauts surrogates, and we had that in Mars 500, and I, Mars 500 was just superbly done. Mm -hmm. uh, as a ground analog, it's just as good as they get in my view, and you could always nitpick and say there's a couple things that should have been different, but frankly, uh, that confinement, the time delays, the communication delays, uh, the mission control, uh, the landing on the surface, the hierarchy and the crew, just perfect. And if you haven't read, read our papers on this, there's a wealth of data in there. I, I'd urge you to read them. One's in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, one's in PLOS One. But you'll see these that when deficits set, psychological deficits, problems, emotional problems, when they begin, they don't ever go away. They just stay. And so you, you plot them cumulatively, and it's a perfect trajectory function. They just stay, and they just are there. And there's little mitigation of them. And, uh, and I actually think that's probably going on to some extent with all due respect to the docs at, and uh, handling NASA's flights. Potential risk and environmental risk is really important. Uh, no easy medical rescue or environmental hazards. So the Antarctic has those characteristics. And NEMO, we did a bunch of NEMOs, and I agree. They, they are superb, really tight confinement, partial gravity, real risk of an error, a potentially loss of life. I mean, Nemo is a terrific one. If it'd go a little longer, I'd like it, but I recognize why you know it can't. Uh, they have to limit the timeline. Isolation and confinement really does help, uh, and Nemo and Hera and um, Mars 500 had that. And that's what I don't like about orbiting Earth. I don't like that you can call your family. I don't want to give you that psychological support. If you're going to Mars, I'm sorry. That's out, okay? Or you're not going to have real time. I want to take away the things that we, we assume that we know aren't going to be there, but yet we keep running simulations going, well, everything will be fine, as long as I can call them. And because every astronaut we've ever talked to at the end, could you go any further, or, or simulated astronaut, and I say, could you go any further? And almost always, and I said this the other day in here, they say, depends on my family. So they're always thinking about their families. That never goes away. And if you put them in contact with them, I think it generally helps them, unless there's a crisis in the family. But it can also create a false sense of how they're going to cope going to Mars if they lose that communication capability. That's my worry. Um, uh, ops like communications, I really, I think now we've got to say that's super important because it just keeps popping up. And the nature of teamwork and interactions, hierarchy, meaningful work is important if they have nothing to do that's meaningful, and there's a lot of meaningful work, uh, I guess, that is going to go on in space flight. Uh, data acquisition facil uh, feasibility is critical. There's no point spending a ton of money to do something where you get, you know, five data points. Get a thousand data points on everybody. Get as many as they'll tolerate. When the astronauts would call, call down an ISSMP would call me and say, so and so says they're sick and tired of your damn test and they don't want to take it anymore. And why the hell do they have to take it every four days? Why the hell do they have to take it twice a day? And then I say, just tell them, please do it if they can. That's it. That's all I got back. And, and it's up to them. They're the subjects. They can do what they want. 
But doing it tells me something about them. They're conscientious. <laughs> they David, will do it. can you describe the test and that you're talking try, about? Oh, it's just a, it's a, it's a three-minute press a button to a light, and it to gives yeah. you your psychomotor speed back, PBT. Yeah. It's, it, it has no learning or aptitude curve. It's unbelievably sensitive to brain state, and particularly not just sleep loss, but we know drugs and other things will affect it, and fatigue, et cetera, stress will affect it. So we don't have specificity with it, but it is a definite, or it's like temperature reading on you for a fever. It's an early warning sign. And finally, data sharing. I have come to believe data sharing is essential. We, we've, we've only got so much money and time to get these analogs done. Investigators in them should be willing to share data and help us leverage what we know. So for me, um, I like it a little on the edgy, hard side. <laughs> and uh, I don't need to tell happy stories about what happened with the crew. What I am interested in is uh, what are the dynamics over time and what are the trait-like differences, phenotypes. Uh, not, I'm sorry, folks. We ain't all created equal. And no matter how long we go to school, we ain't all equal, period. Case closed. <laughs> Thank, thank you, and I, I think that's a nice lead-in for Dr. Gushin as well. Case is <laughs> With, closed. <laughs> no, no. What not can I? Yeah. Yeah. Not only in the United States, not in okay. Russia. <laughs> no, First it of is all, I don't want to be hated uh, by the subjects uh, after <laughs> the experiment uh, in 1999, when for the first time in the history of IBMP we had international crew. One of the crew members, after experiment, tried to see you IBMP and me. Uh -huh in person. I don't want to reproduce this experience. I don't want to feel like Dr. Mengele from Nazi uh, concentration wait camp. Wait a minute. I'm speaking about myself. <laughs> okay. This is Russian experience. Okay. Speaking about high fidelity, it depends on us. Like I was speaking about radiation, fide fidelity and other things depends on us. We can create here on Earth, in analogs, uh, the situation we want to analyze. There, in space, there on uh, Antarctic wintering, we <coughs> do not control numerous uh, variables. So that's not pure scientific. This real life, with all the things that doesn't allow us to analyze real life. What is analog? What is good analog? Good analog is then some uh, parameters are fixed or controlled, and others are analyzed. Let me give you an example. What will be after Mars 500? We are going to launch several isolation studies of various duration, four months, eight months, 12 months. We want to have mixed crews, uh, meaning uh, culturally different, and meaning gender different. For the first time in the history of IBMP, there will be not just one lady in the crew, but several. And that will change the group climate drastically as we expect. And we want to see how that will influence, because we have a lot of crews with uh, several men and just one woman, and that was tough for the woman. We know this, and now we can add some more women and see how that will change the group climate. Second issue we're going to analyze. We're going to analyze how the crew is utilizing the space of the chambers. What we have in IBMP, you can call it low fidelity, low reliability, whatever. But that's the only place in the world where you have several chambers of various size. And so you can see how the crew is using it, how it's utilizing. Why is it so important? You are planning to make the interplanetary vehicle, and you must know what, how much personal space you need for the subject so he can f uh, feel himself comfortable. We're speaking about food. We're speaking about radiation. What about personal space? Nobody can answer. We received the message from Russian Space Agency, you tell us how much space you, uh, we need to plan for the subject. Let's say that 1.3 cubic meters is enough. We can't answer. Why, why 1.3? I don't know. We want to analyze this. And modern technique allows us to measure distances to see how much uh, the crew is utilizing the different spaces. Another question. 
For example, we think that greenhouse is not the place where they're growing plants, but this is the place for psychological support. In Mars 500, that was the case. They can grow their vegetables and fruit, but that was less important than the psychological impact of having this, something they can control by yourself, something that you can grow, and uh, something that is growing under your, uh, your efforts. So we want to see how, what is the preferable place and distance between the greenhouse and the crew. Speaking about the table on ISS, where people are uh, collecting uh, and eating together, where this table must be placed, how much space we require for the collective uh, meetings, that will be, uh, this study is for, we want to do more behavioral studies. We want to do more the study of their activity. We plan countermeasures. We plan physical training. How much it correlates with the daily activity? Nobody knows. We'll try to see. There will be hypodynamia in the chambers. And we measure precisely the activity level and see how it will influence sleep and how it will influence the physical training and how physical training will influence activity, daily activity, and sleep. Again, that will be for the first time. And this is all crucial for the uh, settlement on the planet. The size, uh, the ergonomics, uh, where you place the important, uh, play, uh, the important objects, as we call them. There are no answers for all these things. And nobody's taking care by now. But we want to try to analyze. So what is the high fidelity analog? The analog where I control all these things. And we're going to control all these things, and other things will be uncontrolled. The impact of gender on the personal space. How much space these two, women, or two or three women will require to feel comfortable. That's interesting. It's interesting, and it's uncontrolled variable, we'll see. Uh, but the others will be under the control. I can't do the same on the polar wintering. Despite it's very nice, it's real risky, it's uh, very similar to something. I don't know to what is similar. I think it's, it's uh, something that it is valuable as it is. It's not comparable with space flight, as well as Nemo, as other things. Uh, but anyhow, I want to control variables. On the, in the polar wintry, I can't control them. Because, uh, believe it or not, but uh, part of the missions, they're drunkards. And they're drinking and influencing other people. And this is not the case for space at all. Uh, the another case is that several part of the winterers are people who are escaping from the social surrounding going to that polar wintry. And again, that's not the case for the astronauts. It's absolutely different case and different motivation. So analog itself is, means nothing. The point is how you arrange the study and what you're going to analyze and what you're going to control and how, if you, if you can control the variables. Why I'm so skeptical about that omics? I can't imagine how people can correlate one, uh, several thousands of parameters which are flexible and very sensitive to any, uh, any, any factor. I think this is difficult to, to imagine even because when I see the list of genes and uh, the list of things that, that influence the genes, I feel that I, I can't control all that. And I can define the factor which uh, is the key factor for this kind of change. Uh, one, one example, in one of the laboratories of IBMP, they're analyzing the influence of physical training on the genes uh, which are referring to the muscle activity. And it turned out, it was so, so strange for me, that the psychological mindset is influencing the genes. If I think that uh, this uh, workload will be repeated, the genes will react one way. If I think this is just one, uh, one training session, the reaction of the genes is different. So you see what is so good about chamber study. I can control at least 95% of variables. So I can gain something that which, uh, which is really the answer for something. 
And the way I arranged the study makes it reliable and allows me to speak about the fidelity. If I am doing bad research, the, the, anal the place of the analog is not that important. That's it. Case closed. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay, good. Spasiva. You're up. <laughs> And Graham, I, I, I imagine there's a little bit different twist from, from your perspective and um, the, the work of NSBRI and the pieces that fall into um, you know, different types of analog missions. Yeah, I've been more involved probably on the programmatic side, but backing up, it's interesting kind of hearing the other panelists speak. Um, something that Mike Barrett uh, said really struck a chord with me that analogs are used for either, and Mike, I might have not captured this perfectly, but either training or testing and I didn't probably appreciate it at the time but as a really young guy I did learn about analogs on the training side because the military actually uses analogs a lot. One of the things that almost all military pilots, I think probably 100% of us do, is we go off for a week of survival and what is that an analog for? It's an analog for you're going to crash your airplane somewhere or be shot down and you have to learn to survive before it really happens to you. So we didn't call it an analog at the time. Another thing the military does, and again, this is in the genre of what Mike calls training, is in the Falklands War, the pilots learned, um, the British pilots had trained to fly at 50 feet above terrain. The Argentinian pilots had not trained to fly at 50 feet above terrain. And so what's the point here? The point is that you have to train as you're actually going to fight. And so it comes back to this point that people are making about fidelity, that the use of analogs in terms of training, it, they must be very realistic or the value, the utility um, is, is diminished. Um, Another way to bucket, I think an interesting way to bucket, so Mike buckets analogs into either training or testing modes, I, would, I might bucket them slightly differently. Mostly we've been talking about isolation analogs here, caves, uh, NEMO, the Antarctic, uh, even, you know, clearly ISS is an extreme example of that. So that's one flavor of analogs, this isolation mode where a lot of the time you're looking at behavioral studies, and there can be other pieces to it. Um, as Dr. Gushin alluded to, a lot of the time now with behavioral studies, and I know David Dinges does this, you, you're taking biofluids and things like that because you want to uh, correlate phenotype with genotype. So the isolation analog is one flavor. But another flavor is where you're interrogating some physiological phenomenon. So what are examples of those? Bed rest facilities. In SRL, in SRL we were talking about in a previous panel, that's an analog for space radiation. Um, parabolic flight, right? You're simulating microgravity. And what's quite interesting to me, kind of looking at this more from a program through a programmatic lens, is that the investigators that I work with seem to have more and more success. I mean, we just saw some uh, a downlink from the Canadian station at 82 degrees north, where Jay Bucky is gaining access to uh, yet another isolation analog. There seems to be actually uh, a veritable cornucopia of these isolation analogs. There are, there are more and more of these coming on stream. But there's a curve crossing going on here. Simultaneously, the investigators are actually struggling to get access to parabolic flight. They're struggling to get access to bed rest. And they're not necessarily struggling to get access to NSRL, um, but it is, it, is, um, it is costly and it's somewhat complicated. So my, my point is that as the isolation analogs are, are, I think we're getting more and more access to those. I think simultaneously there's, it's much more challenging to get out access to these analogs that simulate some aspect, some f large, usually physiological aspect of space flight. It might be microgravity um, or space radiation. Those are the two obvious ones. So that's just an observation. And it might be, you know, I don't want to get too controversial here, but I think it's really a pain point for the community that there isn't a bed rest facility. NASA has limited money. And so tough choices have had to be made. You know, here is started up but the bed rest facility is closed, closed down. So, so one door opens, another door closes. But that, I know that's a pain point for the community. A um, couple of other points I wanted to make, because a lot of points have already been, been made. On the programmatic side, again, I, I have the opportunity to sit in on a lot of panels. And one question the panels almost invariably ask is, you want these subjects to be astronaut-like. Tell us what you mean by astronaut-like. It comes up. 
And, and David already said it, right? So there's, there's, there's some obvious things like they can't be 28 and they should be, you know, we know that astronauts by and large, and I, I'm not as familiar with cosmonauts, but I think it's probably not too dissimilar, are typically selected in their 30s and they fly in their 40s. We, and so this is kind of the demographic, but it's more than that. They have typically advanced education. A large number of them come from a military uh, background. You know, still at NASA, about half the, the, the class of eight that was selected, and I know NASA is selecting a new class, the class of eight, four out of the eight were military pilots. So there's still a significant number of military pilots that are coming into, the, into NASA, for example. So what is astronaut like? They, they need to have these kinds of uh, characteristics. So that question comes up a, a lot. And I think it would be good um, if, you know, we talked about standardized measures earlier, it would be good to have some kind of um, agreement on what an astronaut-like subject is. I think that would actually help the review panels and the investigators a lot when they're putting their studies together, because this question just, it, it comes up all the time. Another thing I wanted to pick up on that David David uh, said, and I think it's really important, I, I again have the opportunity to sit in on, on planning, and I'm not going to pick on HERA here, but it's just, it, it's by way of example, on HERA plan, uh, you know, the, 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 the plan for the complement. And I will say HERA has got better and better and better and better. It really has. I'm not just saying that because Bill Pulaski is sitting right in front of me, but it truly has. <laughs> One criticism I do have, though, is there's still a reluctance to induce enough stress. Yeah. Uh, and David's nodding. So <laughs> one thing I've repeatedly raised, you know, I, I started off by saying I went on an air crew survival and I pretty much had very little food for a whole week. But when I say, boy, why don't we think about not giving these guys and gals any food for a day or so, or the food suddenly, you know, like Leroy Chow's situation, it really happened, right? He was down to 1,200 calories. People get very squeamish and they get very concerned, oh, the IRB won't like that or whatever. And maybe the IRB won't like that. I don't know if Chuck Lloyd's listening here, but, but you know, to David's point, um, I think we have to really try to make these high fidelity. Again, it's the example of the Royal Air Force and Royal Navy pilots flying at 50 feet and the Argentinian pilots flying at 250 feet. So, and there's a big difference in how that war, you know, gets fought when you can fly at 50 feet versus 250 feet above terrain. So I think we have to be really willing to, to do some of these things, which aren't terrible, but what, what's really going to happen if someone doesn't get to eat for a couple of days? I didn't get to eat for a week. I'm, I'm still here. So, so I think, David, to your point, it's a really good one that we have to, inc we have to ratchet up the level of stress. Um, so I think those are my contributions to this panel, Nicole. Thanks. Thanks, Graham. And I, th I, know, I know we are running out of time as, as the last panel of the day. I want to thank you all. I think I'd like to open it up for, uh, do we have time for one or two, two questions? Um, if anyone in the audience has a question for the panel, yes. I don't know if we have them. Oh, there we go. And while, while we're going there, one of the things I always think about when it comes to what to me seems to be the best analog, and part of it is the pain factor, I think, the, is that there can't be a minivan waiting outside the door. Which is what I mean. That, that what I think. I mean, it's enough that you know when you go into these things that you're doing. A, you already know this is a two-week thing. This is a three. This is a three-month right. thing. Whatever. So you you already in your brain can say, okay. It's just like when we did um, astronaut candidate selection, and they took you over to this chamber and put you inside that rescue sphere. Mm -hmm. You know, this inflatable ball that was going to be this thing that could transfer you from one vehicle to another if you needed to. And, and it was a claustrophobia kind of thing, I guess. But, you know, you would get into the sphere. And for most of us, I think it was, wow, this, here's a, like, well, I don't know how long I'm going to be in here, but I know I have something on my schedule in 45 minutes, so it can't be any longer <laughs> than that. And, like, time to chill and relax. I mean, find your little comfy spot in there and, and relax. And if we don't have factors that are, are challenging us in these, in these analogs, too, I think a lot of it, like when we did the winter survival, for me, being in a place that I'm not used to, challenging me in a way that 
I might wonder if I can do it or not is is a really good thing. So I think, you know, uh, forgive me, but the, I mean, you're right. It, it, what we're talking about is taking you outside of your comfort zone Absolutely. with as much fidelity as we can and looking at your coping skills and your resiliency Yes. and whether you end up blaming others or if you, if you own it or you can solve it. And we all, we all know what this stuff is, right? It's the way you go through life, figuring out how you're going to cope. And, but astronauts are faced with very special problems. And, and so when the fidelity includes a challenge and they have to cope and then you look at how it affects their relationship with mission control or with each other. That's a really fruitful way to understand uh, what you need to mitigate, if anything, and whether somebody uh, uh, is capable of coping with some of the realistic things yeah. that could happen. Yeah, it's great. We have a question. Yes, sir. So this is a more a, a comment than a question, but um, obviously uh, all the different analogs have different strengths and weaknesses, and there has been whole panels you know, listing them um, we've been lucky enough to be selected for uh, two Antarctic winter overs in the Concordia station, and it was mentioned earlier. Uh, and I think ESA has been doing a very clever job uh, and a very good job. Uh, so the crew actually gets together at the uh, European Astronaut Center in, in Cologne uh, pretty much uh, six to eight weeks before they actually go uh, to the station. Uh, they train together, but it's also used for baseline data collection for all the scientific experiments that have been uh, selected by ESA. So you get your baseline data there. Uh, uh, the other important thing is that they actually have a, uh, an ESA research MD. So there is an MD on the station responsible for the health of the crew, and then there's a, a, a research uh, MD from ESA who is uh, responsible for all the research. So. Uh, making sure that the subjects do whatever they're supposed to do, keeping the morale up so that they're actually uh, participating in the experiments. So this is working really, really well. And then after uh, six, pretty much six months after they come back, uh, they, they go back to Cologne and so that you can do uh, debrief the crew and do post measurements. And we actually, we did neuroimaging in them at Envy Hub in Cologne before the mission and six months after the mission, but then also in Christchurch and Hobart, like immediately after they left after the mission. And I believe that ESA now, uh, because uh, Concordia is very, uh, very high altitude and has uh, hyperbaric hypoxia, so they now extended their program and pretty much encouraged the investigators to do the same research in the Halley Station, the British Halley Station, which is, uh, you know, sea level and uh, not hyperbaric hypoxic, so that you compare the results. So I just want to say, I know that NASA is, is now also, you know, on the search and looking to uh, acquire uh, or, or collaborate with NSF to, uh, in uh, Arctic or Antarctic research station. I think there's, you know, a lot of lessons to be learned from ESA, and I think they, they did a very good job to, to implement their uh, research in this space and lock environment. Yeah, there've been. I mean, there's been at least one in SPRI study in Concordia. I think Pete Roma. So yeah, there was, there's been a, a few, a small number. Uh, our two astronauts, Sergei Rizansky, who is having now the EVA record, uh, the duration of EVA, and Alek Artemiev, they participated in Mars 100. And for them, that was a good training. They tried the most part of the tests they had uh, later in space, I mean medical and psychological tests. So I fully agree with you, Matthias. Sp uh, just one small short comment about the stress. What is stress for different cultures? As I told you yesterday, Today. Uh, having no Chinese tea was so stressful for the Chinese participant of isolation. It was much more, more stressful than spending one, uh, 500 days in, under isolation. Yeah. So for, for him, it was acute stress. For, an, uh, for the Japanese subjects uh, who uh, wanted to f uh, first to participate in first so, uh, Russian isolation study, they were ready to fly in space, but they were not ready to go into the chambers. <laughs> so again, uh, it depends what you feel like stressful thing and uh, what variable really can influence you to the way uh, you, you, you change your behavior and performance. And uh, 
Some people can survive under low, very low temperature, can do without food. Doesn't mean uh, that this is not a stressor, but again, uh, the stressors themselves must be uh, adequate to the objectives of the study. And uh, again, putting a, a single woman into all men crew, uh, in, in my mind, uh, this is uh, very stressful for her. She has to survive under that. Uh, spending one more day in uh, isolation for all women crew in Luna 2015 was an acute stress. And afterwards, they were all time discussing not the seven days and isolation, but that extra day. So again, you have to think about how to, to impose that stress, how to uh, simulate it, and how to create it. This is the real skill. This is the state of art. And uh, when my uh, Chinese colleagues are arranging the study in the way, uh, communication study, by the way, uh, they, first of all, they have all men crew. Then uh, they add one woman. Then they add another woman. And at the end, of course, they have more talks in the crew. I think it's so, 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 so natural before the study. But for them, it was a disclosure that was something interesting. So you see, uh, again, the way you make the study uh, determines the result you get. And fidelity depends on you as an organizer, not on the circumstances, not on the events, not the amount of money and uh, the type of analog. Everything is stressful. Dry immersion is stressful, but it's, no, it's uh, analog of microgravity, not of the flight, because you cannot do a lot of work lying uh, in the horizontal position in the bath. And again, what, what, what we are going to analyze? That's the, the key question. Not the fidelity and reliability, not the choice of the analog. Your hypothesis and your target. Yeah, so let me just add, uh, I mean, I agree with Vadim. The rules of science apply here, and there are many kinds of studies. The, the study we did on ISS is rightly called in our write-up in that an observational study because we didn't manipulate any independent variables. But when possible, when we can get control over environmental variables and know what other things are being controlled, it is really helpful to have that information when you're in, in an analog so that you have some way of beginning to parse out where the variance came from. So the more we share that information and knowing what the stress factors were in a given environment, uh, the better off we are. And the closer we can get, the more control over those conditions, the better off we are. Thank you. I'd like to thank everybody um, and, and the audience as well. And I think this is, uh, we always end up being the last panel of the second day, but I think this is another one that we continue. And I, I look forward to the discussion in our, our side, uh, the team afterwards. And um, thanks again. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, I think.